Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Ben Powell, the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech. Uh, this is our third installment of our Fall Public Speaker Series, and I'll be pleased to introduce our speaker in just one moment, but before I do, I want to introduce our fourth and final installment of the Speaker Series this semester. On Thursday, November 9th, David Scarbrook, who's a professor at Brown University, will be here talking about his award-winning book, The uh, Puzzle of Prison Order. And that one, unlike the rest of the semester, is not over here at the Student Union, but it's over at the ICC, the Intercultural Center, uh, where the flags are kind of next to health sciences. And there'll be a little book signing before that. Uh, Dave's a really interesting character. He's in a lot of work explaining hard private governance solutions. And he's uh, done a lot of American prison systems. And this is him touring around the world looking at why prison order is produced very differently in different countries. Uh, it should be a fascinating talk. I should also mention it's co-sponsored by the sociology department as well, uh, where our criminology program is. Uh, but now, for today's event, uh, I'm very pleased that Lance Pritchett has been able to join us. He is a development economist from Idaho. After graduating from BYU with a bachelor's degree in economics, he attended MIT, where he earned his PhD in 1988. Um, from that point, from uh, 1988 through 2007, he worked at the World Bank, living in Indonesia and in India for multiple years during that time period. Um, he also taught at Harvard's Kennedy School from 2000 to 2004, and from 2017 to 2018. Uh, he was the research director of the RISE program at Oxford School of Government from 2018 to 2023. He's currently a visiting professor at the School of Public Policy at the London School of Economics. And he is the co-founder and research director of LAMP, which is a labor mobility partnership. He has published six books, been part of the team of two different uh, world development reports, and written over 100 journal articles, book chapters, and working papers. Uh, this research has been cited more than 40,000 times by other scholars. Uh, Lamp has written on a range of development issues, including economic growth, labor mobility, state capability, health, development assistance, social capital, population, international trade, safety net programs, and methods of product evaluation. Uh, while he was born in Utah and raised in Idaho, he has lived in five countries, worked in dozens, and visited more than he is years old. And I'm honored that he chose to visit us here in West Texas today. Lamp, welcome. stand behind the podium. Um, glad to be here. Uh, as you heard from the introduction, I've been affiliated with a number of different academic institutions over my lifetime, but only one of them has produced NFL quarterbacks. Uh, and so, <laughs> this is apropos of, I, I probably should say something to ingratiate myself with the audience, but uh, on Saturday, I will be in the BYU section <laughs> of the Texas Tech BYU game. So that probably doesn't ingratiate me. But I will be there to see Texas Tech play, uh, and I, I will root against them, <laughs> as his loyalty demands. OK, today I've been a development economist my whole life, really never done anything else. And by development economist, I sort of want to talk about what I mean by development, why what I mean by development I think is radically super desperately important to the well-being of human beings around the world, but why that vision and conception of development is contested, and not surprisingly for a speaker, why I'm right and everyone else is wrong when they're contesting this vision. So I want to talk about national development, which is being sharply challenged by an alternative view, uh, which I call kinky development. Um, a, a, not just to attract an audience. I, I think it has a technical meaning in this sense. And why national development is a real deal and kink development is just a, a fetish. So here's the overview of the, what I'm going to say in 40 minutes and hopefully leave 20 minutes for Q&A. First of all, national development delivers on improved human well-being for everything. If you want to have high human well-being, you have to have high national development in the way that I'll define it. 
And that's on poverty, that's on overall well-being, that's on basics, that's on kind of any way you want to measure are human beings better off. They're better off in countries that have high national development. On the other hand, kinky development, which is attempting to improve people's human well-being with individual programmatic targeted programs, is mostly uh, ineffective at achieving large-scale changes in human well-being. It's kind of, it can be at the margin cost-effective, but it's just not a big deal. It's a fetish. Um, so, <clears throat> now, why the name Kinky? Well, as we'll see throughout the presentation, everything, any measure of well-being you can imagine kind of has a distribution across people. Some people have more education than other people, some people have better health than other people, people have more income than other people. And one can imagine improving well-being by just shifting that distribution up. Kind of everybody gets more educated. The distribution of education doesn't change. You don't reduce the inequality. Just everybody gets better off. Or you can imagine we take this distribution and we imagine that there's something super important that happens at some threshold, and we try and push everybody up to that threshold. If we were to do that, that would create a kink. There would be a kink at this threshold where we pushed um, people below the threshold to that threshold. So my characterization of kinky development is attempts not to shift the overall distribution, not care about the overall location of the distribution, but really a focus on the bottom end. Uh, and I think that, uh, that leads to very different visions both of what development might be and how to accomplish it. So I want to start with a conversation I had when I was working for the World Bank, living in India, and was working with my colleagues who were designing a project to provide rural water supply. And we went back and forth for like an hour about how you would design a project to improve rural water supply. And finally I, I stopped and I was like, like, we're not really like making any progress here, so maybe let's step back and say, well what's your vision <laughs> of India and water supply in India towards which this project is moving. And they said, well, our vision of water supply in India is that every person in India is within a half a mile walk of 40 liters a day of improved water. <laughs> so this was their vision of adequate water supply, is that you could get to a standpipe that would produce some water that you would then carry in a bucket to your house. And I said, you know, <laughs> my vision of development is everybody takes a hot shower inside their house. Because in my experience, no one who has ever had a hot shower inside their own house has said, gee, I wish I could go back to the days when I had a standpipe and would walk and carry a bucket with all the water I needed for my uses. So, I, if what you're doing is on the path to what I'm talking about, that's development. If you think development's done here, well obviously we can't agree on how to do development because your vision of development doesn't reach my vision of development. So, um, and the kinky view has acquired over time large amounts of attention in which People pay attention to individual gimmicky kind of interventions, interventions or programs that kind of seem to alleviate the problem. So, you know, when I was at Harvard, some Harvard kids as part of some class invented this soccer ball that had a battery in it that would be recharged by motion. So if you kick the soccer ball around, it would generate some power. <laughs> Which is just the stupidest idea in the world. <laughs> and like anybody who had any sense, meaning not Harvard undergraduates, obviously, would know that this was a stupid idea. But somehow in the world, President Obama on a trip to Tanzania, you know, was endorsing this as some, you know, development intervention. Whereas the reality of development is this is what the United States looks at, like at night. This is what Africa looks like at night. And if you look at the consumption, and I put in that this is old data, you know, the, the average Kenyan 
consumes less electricity per year for all of their purposes than a single refrigerator. And the US consumes about 13,000 kilowatt per hour per year, uh, orders of magnitude larger. And again, I've never, <laughs> I've never met anyone who having had the experience of turning on the lights and having the lights come on, wants to go back to candlelight, wants to go back to kerosene, wants to go back to anything other than having more power. So now, <clears throat> so the question is, what's going to deliver on these indicators, these well-being, the overall human well-being? And I define national development as the process whereby countries and here the country more or less is the unit of observation in a, and forgive the word, ontological sense. When you ask, when development happens, <laughs> what's the ontological character of what's developing? It's a country. It's not individuals, it's a country. As a, and countries are systems, and systems have rules <laughs> whereby they work. And national development, in my mind, is an evolution of four types of rule systems that govern a country, that are determined the way in which the country works. One is a set of... Uh, <laughs> will show up on my hand, but not on the screen, so I'll put my hand on the screen. <laughs> anyway, one is a set of systems about how the economy works. And the transformation of development is from a less productive to a more productive economy enabled by what some people call the institutions, but I'm reluctant to, the rule systems that allow and enable people to be productive in a given space. But there's also an administrative set of system. How do organizations administer the government? What's the capability of the government to carry out its purposes? And then there's another transformation from less capable to more capable organizations. And I particularly mean governmental organizations, and we can get back to governmental type organizations don't have to be government. You can delegate to the private sector governmental like functions, but they have to be capable organizations of inducing their agents to do. The third is countries have a polity. They happen to determine who gets to exercise state power. And there's a transformation basically from subject to citizen. <laughs> In whereby historically we've gone from the sovereign gets to be the sovereign and the citizen and the subjects do what the sovereign wants to having the sovereign power of the state controlled through rules whereby they represent the aggregation of what the citizens want. So again, <laughs> I'm using deliberately very abstract terminology because I don't want to prejudge how this happens. So I'm not using the word democracy. I'm saying the polity operates in a way that represents the interests of the citizens. Democracy is one way you can imagine aggregating this. There's lots of variants of democracy, and I don't want to settle on ex ante. <laughs> but there is a transformation in which the needs and wishes of the citizens get represented in, in the exercise of state power. And finally, there's an evolution of um, kind of away from primary identification with kith and kin towards a equal treatment of all citizens. And those four transformations is what I call national development. And the further are you out on any of these in a way that we can more or less measure, the more your country is developed. Now, the premise of development, which emerged basically when the formal colonies became free of the sovereignty of the colonial powers, the vision of development and the premise was if countries have more national development, have more productive economies, have more productive states, have more responsive states, have more equal treatment, human well-being, which is measured by the actual experience of well-being, will be better. So national development was never an intrinsically important objective. It was a means to an end. It was a means to the end of higher well-being. Right? And so the question is, 50 or 60 years into the development process, is it the case that national well-being reliably delivers on higher human well-being? Because a lot of people are debating that. Oh, we don't really need economic growth, or we can achieve our human well-being objectives without 
this overall process of development. And my argument, which I'm now going to show you empirical evidence for, is national development delivers completely, totally on well-being and nothing else does. Meaning national development is an empirically necessary condition for high human well-being, and it's an empirically sufficient condition for high human well-being. So and I'm going to talk about three majors, poverty, basics of material well-being, and an overall measure of human well-being. Um, so now, I hope that at least some of you who aren't well acquainted with development are thinking, why is he wasting our time? <laughs> this has to be obvious to everyone who works in development. Unfortunately, it's not. Bill Gates, a few years ago, proposed that poverty in Africa could be addressed by the transferring ownership of chickens. <laughs> which I call the chicken shit theory <laughs> of development. This is just, and Bill Gates, he's a nice guy. I, you know, I haven't even met Bill Gates, he's a nice guy. He, in some domains, is a smart guy. But this is just dumb. But worse than that is my friend and fellow economist Chris Blattman responded that the best investment to fight world poverty would do a randomized control trial that ran a horse race between transferring chickens and cash. So this is now meta stupid. <laughs> this, isn't, this isn't a dumb idea. This is a dumb idea about a dumb idea. Right? The response was, chickens? Really? That's just stupid. But instead the response is, oh, let's do an RCT to compare a poverty program that transferred individuals chickens versus transferred individuals cash to see which works better to fight poverty. So we're, <laughs> and uh, my hardest time about giving public speeches is not sounding like a raving lunatic. Um, and you might think, hey, other people can't possibly believe what he's saying they believe. But that's why I have this quote. They really, OK. So first, <clears throat> here are the facts about poverty. The way in which poverty is typically measured is you do surveys of household consumption. You see their total expenditures. And you say a household is in poverty if their total expenditures are below some threshold called the poverty line. And this is the World Bank's data at three different poverty lines about the relationship between the median, and the median is the point of the distribution of 50 above, 50 below, so it's the typical income, between the median income and the headcount poverty rate, the fraction of people in poverty. Now, I, don't, I, I was asking if I can like, talk about R squared with this audience, but I don't even need to talk about R squared. You can look at that and say, <laughs> the median and the poverty rate are unbelievably tightly associated. There just are not tons of deviations where countries have higher or lower poverty than you would predict based on just knowing their median. And the R squared is, 0.988, which means only 2% of the total variation in poverty rates around the world isn't accounted for by knowing the median. If you know the median of a country, you know everything about the country's poverty rate. There's nothing else to know. So not only, so what that means is that in this graph of median and poverty, the interesting part is the white space. <laughs> because the white space, since every dot is a country year experience, the white space are things that never happen. All right? So what never happens? <laughs> what never happens is that you get low poverty with low median income. It just doesn't happen. Right? It, it's not a possible combination. It's not an ever observed state of affairs. And conversely, <laughs> you actually don't see countries with high median and high poverty. So no one is here. And these are just drawn, these lines are just drawn to show no country has poverty lower than this without having income higher, median income higher than this, right? So <laughs> these boxes are empty. So this is what I mean by high median income meaning high income of the typical person in the economy, is a necessary and sufficient condition for low poverty. 
It's necessary. You don't get low poverty without high median. It's sufficient. If you get high median, you get low poverty. Which means <laughs> that I didn't have to say anything about any poverty program. Like, I can tell you what a country's poverty is without asking you anything about do they have poverty programs? What poverty programs do they have? How much do they spend on them? How are they designed? It's pretty much, and again, not pretty much. <laughs> I mean, I, I've worked a long time with data, and it's like, you don't get an R squared of 0.988 between two measures of the same thing across countries. If you take two measures of child mortality across countries, you get an R squared of like 0.95. So the fact that these are so highly correlated, I mean, there's just nothing else really of importance about reducing poverty other than living in a country with high median. Um, and this is also true in changes. Uh, this is the same graph just showing over a spell of growth and a spell of poverty change, they also line up completely. Uh, if you had large reduction in poverty, it was because you were predicted to have large reduction in poverty by the change in your median and vice versa. So again, this is the cross section and the changes on changes line up exactly. Um, and like <laughs> the relationship is literally one for one. The predicted and the actual are just super tightly correlated at exactly one to one rate. So if you want to reduce poverty, you have to improve the median. Like just full <laughs> stop. Okay. So <clears throat> let me so now let me move on because you might say, and you might be right, oh well that's just money metric measures of people's income. What about their access to things we care about, like basic education, health status, malnutrition, or access? We might have independent preferences that humans have access to certain things. And I have no objection to that. <clears throat> Some, but I won't share it. Um, <laughs> but now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, OK, take, uh, now I ask, well, what? I'm showing this graph because I hope many of you took some economics. And maybe when you were taking your economics, you thought, why the heck are we doing this? Well, one thing is, if you think about what the relationship, if something's really basic, what should the relationship look like as people get richer? Well, at low levels of income, they should consume a lot more of it. And then at the margin, they're going to consume relatively less of it as they get richer. <coughs> So we would expect from the most basic act, whatever it's called here, Texas Tech, Act 10 or Act 101 or whatever, we would expect that basics would be highly correlated with income and that that relationship would be nonlinear. That's exactly what we see when we build an index of basics. So let's take the data on basics from around the world. Let's build them into an index. Do people in this country have basic across the board. Basic water, basic education, basic health. Let's combine them in, in, into an index and then let's ask what's the relationship between GDP per capita and basics? And you see exactly what you would expect to see. There's a very strong relationship. The, the R squared of this relationship is 0.88. So nearly all the variation in <laughs> citizens having basics is accounted for just by GDP per capita. Second, the relationship is incredibly steep at low levels. So when countries are poor, incremental gains in uh, income lead to a lot of gains in basics and tapers off. So for very high income countries, this is, uh, you know, countries above about 40,000, it tapers off and like, yeah, because people are very near having all the basics. So it's not, it's not linear as we, as we think. And I've done this graphic thing of saying, here are the kind of limits to what happens, meaning this is the lowest basics can be at any level of GDP, and this is the highest basics can be at any level of GDP. And there's a pretty narrow range of experience. Countries don't get to high levels of, of basics without having high levels of GDP, and countries don't get to high levels of GDP without having high levels of basics. Again, <laughs> living in a productive economy is a necessary and sufficient condition 
to having access to the things we think of as important to human well-being in a material sense. And I'm using material just in a physical indicator of subjective happiness. By the way, subjective happiness looks a lot like that. I don't want to go into it. Okay. So <clears throat> the last thing is I'm increasing. You see what I'm doing? That's what I'm saying. First of all, care about poverty? All you need to care about is income. Second, care about basics? All you need to care about two first order is income. <laughs> now I'm going to expand the array of what I'm talking about a bit. Um, so I'm on an airplane. And um, I'm talking to the person next to me, and I say, oh, well, what are you doing? Well, I'm working for this institution called the Social Progress Institute. Oh, that's interesting. Social progress is a good thing. What do you guys do? Well, we think economists overstate the importance of economic things and understate the importance of these non-economic things. So we're building an index called the Social Progress Index of country well-being that doesn't involve any economics at all. Terrific. I hope you don't ask me what I do for a living, because I do the opposite. <laughs> uh, and then I thought, hmm, I wonder if we took this economics free index and put it up against, against national development, what it would look like. Is it the case that there's a lot of variation in social progress for any given level of national development? And this is this is just showing you they created a social progress index in the way that if you were, you know, economics free, you would do it. You would ask your friends what's important. You would make, make measures of them. All of these things up here are kind of, it's hard to have any, like, super severe objection that they belong in some index of human well-being. Um, and then they categorized it into basic human needs, foundations of well-being, opportunity, which are sort of higher higher order kind of needs, um, and then they aggregate it all into the social progress index. Okay, so what I do is I say, let's just look at three measures of national development. So now I'm going beyond GDP per capita to include other measures of national development, which I think are important. I'm including GDP per capita, a measure of state capability, which is just uh, the World Bank produces measures of countries' governance capabilities, um, and just a simple index, and a measure of democracy. And I say, here's, let's just create a regression, and with a regression we can create an index of national development that has the weights of the regression to create the index. So I add up GDP, democracy, and capability in the way that it says that this would help you best predict the SPI. And so here's the social progress index, and here's the national development index. And I created again this graph, which I, I, I invented for me. I don't know if anybody else has done it, but I invented it. I created the envelopment curve. <laughs> Every country's experience in the world fits in between those two lines. So no country has higher social progress than this at this level of development, and no country has, um, at this level of national development, no one has GDP per capita, uh, no one has national development lower than this. So this is the array of possible experiences. Every country fits into that envelope. And what do you notice about the envelope? What do you notice about the graph? Lots of white space. <laughs> this just doesn't happen. Countries don't get to higher levels of social progress without having high levels of national development. And nobody's down here either. You don't get to high levels of national development and not get to high levels. So if you are a country that aspires to your people having a high level of human well-being measured by this completely economics-free index of well-being, the only demonstrated path is high national development. Just, you can imagine <laughs> going here, but you can only imagine it. You don't have anybody demonstrating that it's possible, right? So, the upshot, and then now, once I bring in state capability, it's important because I'm kind of a really big believer in economics, and I'm a really big believer in economic progress, but it's not the only thing. 
There really are public goods in the world, and the government really does have important roles in providing law and order and in providing things. And so one can ask how much of the gain as you move in national development comes from just GDP per capita and how much comes from improved state, improved governance. And I combine state capability and democracy into governance. And what this graph says, in a way that's completely impenetrable, so I have no fear of being <laughs> rebutted on this. Um, but what this does is say, different indicators of well-being respond differently to growth versus governance. And things that are pure public goods in the economic sense, not surprisingly, respond strongly to state capability and weakly to private income. And things that are basically private goods respond strongly to income and not so strongly to state capability. So if you look at, uh, and some of these may surprise you, but if you look at uh, shelter, the first of these is shelter, and the top bar is growth, and the second bar is governance, and the black bar is total. All of the improvement in shelter across countries comes from growth. What governments do about the quality of shelter really doesn't seem to have much impact on the quality of shelter people have. Kind of makes sense. <laughs> quality of your house might be impeded a bit by governments mucking around a bit, but basically you can buy what you buy and you buy more when you have more, right? No. Perhaps more surprisingly to some people, water and sanitation looks the same. Getting adequate water and sanitation is mostly having income. Uh, uh, and then you get down here, and again, not entirely surprisingly, things like rights and tolerance uh, respond mainly to improvements in governance and very little to improvements in income. So I'm kind of <laughs> not a growth fundamentalist. I am kind of don't want to understate the role of growth, but there's more than growth. You actually need a functioning government for order to achieve all of the dimensions of well-being. But that, in my view, is an integral part of national development. And it's broad-based state capability. This is just a measure of the capability of the government. It's not a measure of expenditures. It's not a measure of focus on this issue. I don't need to know whether you're focused on an issue to know whether or not you're successful at it. I just need to know your income and your capability. So summary of part one is <laughs> national development, the transformation of countries, to inclusive productive economies, capable administration, responsive states, and equal treatment is empirically necessary and sufficient condition to improve human well-being. Uh, with a little proviso of global public goods, because there's nothing about national borders and national that necessarily says they're going to achieve good global public goods, but within the realm of human well-being that can be produced at the national level, it's everything. And surprisingly everything. Because a lot of attention gets paid to how much are you spending on X? Or what programs do you have on Y? And that turns out to be second order to your overall status in national development. Okay. So I'm going to give you the summary of part two, uh, which is go back to part one. <laughs> <laughs> Why the hell would we have a part two? Uh, <laughs> just kidding. Oh, no, really. <laughs> I really am not kidding. <laughs> it's, this is what necessary and sufficient means, is that we really don't need another part two. Right? That's embedded in necessary and sufficient. So <laughs> um, you want to go on, but I think that's just because I use kinky and fetish, because you're now convinced that what I'm going to say isn't really that important. Um, so summary of part two is, I'm not denying that there are individual programs or projects or actions that can be highly cost effective, but they're mostly mitigation of the lack of national development rather than a contribution to national development. And <laughs> they're pretty rare, and they have limited upside. So uh, I did a study together with two co-authors in which we actually did this very interesting and qualitative exercise to see in these villages who were the people that people thought had moved out of poverty. So we had them do a before and 
after ranking of everybody in the village in terms of their change of economic status. So we could identify, not from self-report, but we could identify who people thought had moved out of poverty. And then we asked people, <laughs> how did you move out of poverty? <laughs> It's kind of a stupid thing for an economist to do, but sometimes I was working with non-economists, so we asked people <laughs> questions. Um, and it turns out, uh, people who moved out of poverty attributed to having undertaken some new economic initiative, either in agriculture or non-agriculture, hard work and asset accumulation. When you ask them, why aren't you poor now when you were poor before? It's because I did something new, I got a new job, I started a new business, I worked hard and I accumulated assets. And NGO assistance illegal activities in the lottery were the same order of magnitude. <laughs> like, I, I think we interviewed 1,700 people, this is a massive study, and like nine of them said NGOs helped or something. It was just a ridiculously small number. So, and that just says, look, when people have opportunity, they pursue opportunity. When they have opportunity to pursue it, they tend to have improved well-being outcomes. And anything else just is second order to that. Here, let's get more scientific in the current way. The kind of <clears throat> people we call randomistas uh, that believe in using randomized controlled trials to elicit truths about the world. <laughs> And everything I say, I just can't stop my fingers from doing this when I start talking about RCTs. It's like, just, <laughs> it's like, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> I know it's rude, but <laughs> science. <laughs> um, okay, so they did a study of basically an asset transfer program to the chronic poor where they gave uh, households livestock assets as part of a general, very complex um, eight element program. And the reason there were eight elements in the program because one of the world's best anti-poverty NGOs, RAC, uh, which is a Bangladeshi NGO, had been working for 20 years to refine this program so that it actually worked. And most of the previous variants didn't work. So they kept adding features to make it work. And at the end of those 20 years of product improvement, they did the randomized control trial to see if it worked. So this isn't an idea someone had. This is someone, people working in the field that iterated for 20 years to get to this program. Then they invited in the randomnesis to evaluate it. And the upshot is, and this was published in Science Magazine, the world's top two most reputed scientific journals. Uh, and the average across they, they did six countries, I'm only showing five of them, because in one of them, Honduras, um, they gave people chickens as an asset, and they all died. So I won't even count that one. I'll, I'll spot you one country, right? In the five countries in which it worked, <clears throat> you spent $4,500 per household over the first two years of program implementation to generate $344 in incremental income. This, they proclaimed it was a success. And you can see, I just can't stop it. I can make, well, anyway, this was a success, which they now, on their website, encourage you to invest in, because it's a proven, I can't stop it, proven program that helps the poor. But I think if you came to any business person in the world and said, I have a good idea, <laughs> let's, just, let's spend 4000 $500 of two year, over two years of investment to generate $344 in incremental net income on the assumption that if that $344 is permanent and stays forever, it's a 7% rate of return. <laughs> like, no, no, we're not doing that. That's, this is not a good return. But this is the gold standard. This is what the kinky can produce at its best. And, and again, I'm, I'm not claiming this. this. is The claim of the people who proclaim that kinky works show this as an example, right? Um, now, it gets worse than that. And I'm really looking the time, so I think I'm okay. I'll be, yeah. Um, which is, then people do these studies. So there was a recent study in Nature magazine. And Nature and Science are the two top 
scientific journals in the world, in which they did a program in Niger that involved a cash transfer, and then they added a psychosocial intervention to the cash transfer. So people who were getting the kind of transfer in this experiment either got or did not get a psychosocial intervention. And the point of the argument is the psychosocial intervention was super successful. <laughs> That's how it's played, right? And uh, the psychosocial intervention um, did raise income. Can you guys see these numbers? Can you see them? Yeah. I guess when I get closer, I see them worse. But from $1.70 of consumption per person per day to $1.88. So that's like the whole program um, <clears throat> with all components uh, increases incomes in these households by 25 cents per person per day. So once a week, one person in the household could have one additional diet cook. That's the impact. Again, this is their version of success because the psychosocial intervention was really cheap. And since it was really cheap, you could have a super high cost effectiveness, even though the absolute magnitude was tiny. But this is what success looks like, <coughs> is that income in Vietnam in 1992 was exactly what it was in Niger, and today it's $8.87 a day. That's national development. That's success. That reduces poverty because all of these people are still really, 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 really poor by any definition of poverty. So again, these programs can be incrementally cost effective, but they're not transformational. They don't add up to anything. And, you know, it just drives me completely, totally around the bend that they're doing this with 11 economists as co-authors in Niger. OK, why do I say Niger? Well, there's this phrase. I don't use it very often. Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. But it just so happens this is literally Jesus, Mary, and Joseph in the sense that Niger's GDP per capita in 2018 was lower than it was in Egypt when Jesus went there. That's how poor Niger is. <laughs> you know your Bible? And I, I walked from my hotel cotton up the street. And there's lots of churches, so you should know your Bible here in Texas. You know, Jesus fled to Egypt when he was a child. When he got there, GDP per capita was over $1,000. In Niger today, it's under $1,000. Why? <laughs> You would go about thinking you're doing development by pestering people in Niger with a psychosocial intervention. <laughs> Jesus, Mary, and Joseph. Like, this is just ridiculous. So, um, and, you know, in a lot of domains, it's just not inequality that's the issue. Things are just bad for everyone because of a lack of national development, or lack of success in the sector. So a very recent paper I just did, we compared the, the learning outcomes of children across countries, and I'm just going to focus on Zambia, and we said, you know, everybody's focused on, you know, are the rural doing as well as the urban, are boys doing as well as girls, are the poor doing as well as the rich, so they're focused on inequalities within Zambia. But we said, well, here are... <laughs> The 95th percentile on a socioeconomic status, boys living in rural areas who are non-migrants who speak the dominant language. So the advantaged elite. The advantaged elite in Zambia score 233 points, which roughly means a Zambian kid in eighth grade is at a Vietnamese second grade level. They score unbelievably below kids in Vietnam. And the most advantaged kids in Zambia score both unbelievably below the poorest kids in Vietnam, but also this is the global minimum learning level. So 
So if you eliminated all the inequality in Zambia by getting everybody to the educational performance of the advantaged elite, you would still be at a globally unbelievably crappy education. So programs that focus on inclusion are stupid when there's nothing to be included into. <laughs> there's nothing there. So that was, okay, so um, why Kinky doesn't work is without a productive economy, there's nothing to spend. Uh, you know, Niger's total G in the C plus I plus G plus X minus M sense was $144 per person, right? Uh, <laughs> the typical American household spends $900 per person on pets, toys, hobbies, and recreational equipment. So what is the government of Niger supposed to do? If it has the most effective programs in the world, it's got to do everything it does with $144. Second, without a capable state, you can't implement the programs even that are proven to be effective and they can't be implemented with fidelity at scale. So even if I say, if you could do this BRAC thing, it would work, <coughs> the governor of Niger can't do this BRAC thing um, <laughs> without being a capable state and without a responsive state, why would they? So without national development, the kingdom's just kind of irrelevant. And it's a fetish in the real sense that it's not really caring about other people. It's caring about how you look, how you feel, how, what you're doing. So there's a question. What are the actions such that if they were accomplished would lead to much higher levels of human well-being? Well, national development really pays off. Then there's the question, what can I personally do to encourage those actions that would lead to higher human well-being to happen? That's a good question. Then there's the question that kinky development asks, which is, what is it that I can personally do that would have some positive impact and for which I personally can take some credit? That's a bullshit question. <laughs> That's a fetch. That's a perversion of pretending to care about other people while really caring most about what you want. And so my final conclusion is, <laughs> most people that have low well-being have low building not because of the choice, because of the choices they have, because of where they live, not because of the choices they make. So mucking about you know, the choices they make is just obscene to me when they don't have good choices. And so I would encourage that love the neighbor as they self is pretty damn good advice. And that would involve doing good economics, not poor economics. Thank you very much. <laughs>